All right, so let's read a little bit more in the text here. Um, all right, uh, so we see, actually see there, in 13 verse 1, they are in Antioch. Which Antioch is this, by the way? Syrian Antioch or Pisidian Antioch? Uh, Syrian. Syrian Antioch, okay, all right. So there are prophets and teachers there. Remember the prophets came down from Jerusalem in chapter 11, 27. Uh, Barnabas and uh, Simeon, and there's a guy whose uh, surname, his Latin surname is uh, Niger, just a, a Latin word for someone who's dark complexion there. Uh, that was just kind of this. Simeon is a very common name, so they had to give him a surname. Uh, I guess some guy named Lucius. Uh, then you got uh, uh, Saul. They were ministering to the Lord, fasting. The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have for them. They fasted and prayed, laid their hands on them, sent them away. So they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute. Verse 3, who sent them out? Holy in verse 3, who sent them out? Yeah, the church. The church in Antioch. The church in Syria Antioch. Okay, but in verse 4, who sent them out? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Is there a contradiction there? No. The Holy Spirit was the ultimate authority, and the church followed the Spirit there, okay? All right, it's pretty clear. Okay, so they go to Seleucia. Seleucia is the port. And from there, they go to Cyprus. Cyprus is that, uh, is that little island there. Not the little island. It's actually a pretty big island. Okay. All right, then they reach Salamis. Okay, that's where they, where they got Salami from. They began to proclaim the Word of God. What's the Word of God? Gospel. That's the gospel. And they are proclaiming it to the synagogue of the Jews. It's their their fashion to start with the Jews first and then to go to the Gentiles. Okay? Then they go all the way to Paphos. Okay? By the way, they have John there as a helper in verse 5. That's John Mark. Okay? So they, then they go to Paphos, which is on the left side of the city. And they come across a magician, a, false, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. And he was with the, pro, the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. Alright? So. They come across a false prophet named Bar Jesus, who is a Jew working for the proconsul Sergius Paulus in Paphos. Both these individuals need to be addressed within this episode, okay? Sergius Paulus, he was the proconsul of Cyprus from the years 46 to 48. That's how we can date this particular missionary endeavor, okay? All right, this is, and so they come to this fairly early in, in the first missionary journey, so we're guessing that probably somewhere around the 46, 47 time period, okay? He is depicted as an intelligent ruler, and he is the one actually who summoned Paul and Barnabas so as to hear the gospel. Where do we see this? Verse 7, this man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. However, he has been duped into including in his entourage, like that word, a Jewish magician, okay? But Luke kind of portrays him as, he's, he's a guy, he's interested in hearing the gospel, he's an intelligent guy. He doesn't seem to be an unfair person, like an unfair, evil tyrant, but he's got this Jewish magician in his court. Okay? Now, Luke portrays this, Jew, this Roman ruler as a sensible governor, one who seems to be persuaded by the Christian gospel message. Okay? We see this here in verse uh, 12. So he hears the gospel and he sees um, Paul do this miracle to Bar Jesus. What miracle did he do? Did you guys read the text? It's really important that we read the passage before we come to class today, day, guys. All right. In verse 11, now the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind, and you will not see forever or four times. Four times. Tem temporary blindness, okay? So, but once he sees this, verse 12, then the proconsul believed when he had saw, and he was amazed at the Lord's teaching, the teaching about the Lord, the teaching of Jesus. Okay? So, Luke portrays this guy. He's, he's willing to be persuaded by the Christian message. And he's also willing to be dissuaded from the fraud magician. Okay, should we close parentheses there? Uh, this contributes to Luke's emphasis that the early Christians, by the way, are a socially healthy force within the Roman Empire. The magicians, however, are considered a socially unhealthy force. Okay, because let's imagine you're a Roman in the first century. You're hearing about, oh, there's this guy, this Jew, and he does miracles and signs and wonders, and he was dead, and now he's back alive. If you're a you know sophisticated Roman, you're thinking that's just superstitious, that's just nonsense, that's just hocus pocus. The contrast between the Christian missionaries here and the Jewish magician would insist upon Luke's early readers that the Christian sect was not characterized by magic, as Paul and Barnabas actively opposed magic. In other words, the early Christianity should not be interpreted within the realm of magical superstitions. Okay, Luke is trying to say, hey, this is something that even intelligent Roman officials can be persuaded by, 
and it opposes the superstitious ma mag magical stuff. Okay, that's the kind of argument that Luke is, is giving to his early readers. We think. All right, yeah. Is that another magician in his No, 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 no. That's another name for him. Oh, okay. It's another name for him. And actually, I, I think there's some points in regard to this. What do you think? Well, it says Christianity shall be interpreted within the realm of magical superstitions. What about like miracles, casting out of demons, and casting lots? Yeah. It, it, uh, it, it would depend on how they go about uh, getting their power from this, okay? Because they're always saying that the miracles that Jesus did were not from his own power, but God was working through him, okay? That would not be superstition. That would be a pretty normal thing. Um, you know, the reason why uh, Caesar was able to conquer others in his battles is because God was working through him, or the gods were on his side, okay? It wasn't because, you know, they were killing an animal and breaking open its, its, its carcass and kind of looking at certain things, or they were um, soothsayers, or they were looking at stars, and being like astronomers and astrologers and that sort of like it's, it's a different sort of, uh, of way that they're receiving their power. So I think that's a good question there. It's a good question. Okay. All right. So we, we talked about Sergius Paulus there, by the way. Okay. Uh, then we got Bar Jesus, who's also known as Alevis. We have no idea what this word Alevis means, by the way. I've looked and looked. I, I have no idea what it means. Okay. There are a lot of people that have guesses, but nothing is really conclusive. Okay. But Bar Jesus, Bar is the Aramaic word for sun. And Jesus just means Jesus or Joshua. Okay? There are a lot of Jesus and Joshua's in the Bible. Alright? Joshua's a pretty common name. So, if his name is son of Joshua, um, what is his ethnicity? Jewish. Jewish. Okay? We already know that. Luke has told us he's a Jewish prophet. Okay. Notice he is described in the text in verse 6 as a magician first and a Jewish false prophet second. This indicates that from Luke's and Paul's perspective, our Jesus is primarily a magician rather than a fellow Jew, okay? He is said, and a magician is someone who receives his power and his magic from another source, okay? Remember when remember, uh, when Saul the king goes to the witch of Endor, yeah. okay? He gets his, his insight and his understanding not from Yahweh, but from the witch of Endor. That's why it's condemned as wrong uh, for his behavior. He gets his magical insight from someone other than God. And that's why magicians and sorcerers are condemned in the Hebrew Bible. All right. Now, uh, this would not be the last time that Jews make alliances with Romans. Okay, I want you to think about how scandalous this is. For Jewish conservative Jews to align themselves with unclean Romans. We've already seen in the Jerusalem church how, like, that's a problem. But now we've got a Jew aligning himself with the Roman governor, okay? Uh, so the conservative Jews would say that's completely wrong. But the book of Acts will continually depict these scandalous relationships. We're going to see at the end of this book that Jews from the synagogue are going to align themselves with some devout men of the city, these Roman men of the city, in order to cast out and to, uh, um, uh, and to banish Paul and uh, Barnabas from the city. And so you have this relationship of, of Jews, the people of God, aligning themselves with Romans. And if you have a synagogue aligning yourselves with Romans, guess what some of the conservative Jews will say about that synagogue? John of Patmos, in the book of Revelation, calls it a synagogue of Satan. Why? Because they're a synagogue. Instead of aligning themselves as a distinct holy people of God being set apart, they're aligning themselves with Rome, so they're aligning themselves with Satan, in that sense. Not that Rome is, is Satan, but it's, they're, not, they're not a synagogue of the Lord, they're a synagogue of Satan. Okay? So we see that Jews compromising and aligning themselves too much with the world um, was, was something that even other Jews um, would, would, would disagree with them on. Okay, uh, our Jesus, by the way, was seeking, the, the Greek verb is zeteo, seeking to turn Paulus from the faith, while Paul, Paulus, that's a, a Sergius Paulus, was seeking to hear the word of God. Notice they're both seeking, using the same Greek verb. One is seeking to turn Paul, Sergius Paulus from the faith, while Paulus is seeking to hear the gospel. Okay, Paul identifies Bar Jesus as the son of the devil. That's a pretty strong term, by the way, okay? Notice he was a Jew, but now he's the son of the devil, indicating a lack of association with the Jewish religion into which he was born. Remember, he's the son of the devil. What did uh, uh, John of Patmos say? Synagogue of Satan. He's aligning himself with Rome, okay? Paul strikes Bar Jesus with temporary blindness. How the magician seeks, or sorry, that should be now. Now the magician seeks those who will lead him as a guide just as he formerly sought to guide Paulus. What verse is that? Um, 
verse 11. At the end of verse 11, he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. So he used to seek people, he used to seek to, to draw people away from the faith, but now he's seeking someone to help him. How the tables have turned. All right. The uh, miraculous judgment upon Bar Jesus, accompanied with the preaching of the gospel, leads Sergius Paulus to convert. And nothing further is known about him. We don't know what he did. We don't know if he had to leave his position. We don't know if he got baptized. We don't know how he joined it. We just we don't know. All we know is that Luke is depicting that intelligent Roman officials can even be convinced of the Christian message and be dissuaded from Jewish superstitious uh, magical works. Okay. Now, check this out. I think that Luke gives a contrast or a comparison with Bar Jesus, this guy named uh, Elimus, and with Saul. This is Saul, otherwise known as Paul. Okay? Bar Jesus is known as a false prophet, but Saul is known as a true prophet. Okay? He's in the midst of the prophets of the church. Bar Jesus has two names, Bar Jesus and Elimus, one of which provides a wordplay. Bar Jesus means son of Jesus of Joshua, and the alternative is son of the devil. He's like, oh, you want to be son of somebody? You can be son of the devil. I mean, there's a pun there. Saul has two names, Saul and Paul, one of which coincidentally provides a connection with Sergius Paulus. Actually, in the Greek, the word Paulus uh, is, is in the same Greek as Paul's name. Okay? So notice both of them have two names. Okay? Or Jesus twists the Lord straight away, 13 verse 10, which says, um, You are full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, the enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? passage in Isaiah says, make straight the ways of the Lord, make his path straight. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Isaiah 40, verse 3, okay? All right? Paul once opposed the way, which I argue is, is a depiction from Isaiah 40, verse 3, but now he preaches the way, okay? So this guy twists the Lord's straight ways. Paul used to, but now he preaches it. He was blinded, and he saw someone to lead him by the hand. Saul was also blinded on the way to Damascus. Someone had to lead him by the hand. He is full of deception, but Paul is full of the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's some interesting parallels there. Okay? So the whole point is, don't be like this magician. So sometimes, like, can we make a dichotomy to the point where it'll either, like, be comparing them closely together, or it'll be making a contrast. Like, this is this is one person, but on the other hand, this is the other person. Yeah. Yeah. He's, I, I, don't, I don't want to call it a compare or contrast. I just think he parallels another figure. Yeah. So, so the thing is, Sometimes he parallels a figure from the Old Testament. Sometimes he parallels a figure from the New Testament. Sometimes he parallels a figure in the book of Acts itself. You know, but Luke is just doing this. Like, nowadays, when I, when I show you more of these, you're not going to be surprised anymore. Because how many of these have we seen now? Like, a dozen. Like, this shows, again, that Luke is a sophisticated writer. Okay. All right. All right. So, after this conversion... Paul and the crew, they set sail from Paphos and they arrived at Pergia. If you look on your map, they've now gone from Crete and they were on their way all the way up to the coast of Asia Minor, today modern day Turkey. All right? It's the southern part of it. All right? Into the district of um, um, Pamphylia. Wow, that's freaking out, man. <clears throat> all right. It is, uh, it is here, by the way, that Luke notes that John Mark simply leaves them without any sense of conflict. What passage is this? 13, what? 13, 13. Yeah, 13, 13. Okay, John left then and returned to Jerusalem. You want to mark in your notes there, by the way, 1538, where we see that Mark has deserted Paul using a Greek word that's much harsher. Okay? Again, Luke has a tendency to kind of downplay conflict. Okay? And what we see here, by the way, is that Paul later, when he's getting ready to go on his next missionary journey, he's like, I don't want to take this guy because I can't trust him. And he doesn't want to forgive him because of his actions. Okay, so, um, so Mark gets cold feet and he goes back home to his mom. He goes back home to, to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Because his mom has a house there. All right. So John Mark's a mama's boy, but we have a gospel written by him, so I guess we should forgive him. All right. <clears throat> From uh, Pergia, okay, they arrive at, uh, actually at at the city of Antioch. Okay, this is the second Antioch. It needs to be distinguished from Syrian Antioch. Okay. Here they attend a local synagogue service and are invited to give a word of exhortation. Paul gives his first sermon in Acts, okay? So this is Paul's first sermon. We've seen how many sermons from Peter? We've seen three sermons from Peter, okay? Now we see the first sermon um, from Paul. It's not to be the last one. All right, so 
Remember the, uh, the sermon by Stephen, the longest sermon? When he gives the history of Israel, he's actually setting it up to say, oh, like the history of Israel has been a bad thing, and you guys all along have kind of rejected God's prophets. When he gives the, the, the history of, uh, of Israel's salvation, uh, he's not using it in a negative way. He's just using it to bring along the story. All right? So it begins with the recital of Israel's salvation history. He starts from the patriarchs, he goes to Egypt, the wilderness, the conquest of Canaan, the period of the judges, and then he goes to Samuel, Saul, and then David. And he's going to focus quite a bit on David. I think that's kind of the first point that he's, uh, <clears throat> that he's going to give, uh, uh, I think, some emphatic attention. All right. Uh, verse uh, 22. After he had removed him, after he, God, had removed Saul, the king, he raised up David to be their king. Concerning him, he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Okay? So, um, 1322, it's really, really important, by the way, um, to, to get the sense of how this story is unpacking. Uh, so I'm going to make an argument for how we interpret Acts 1333, the, the contents of your paper. All right. 1322 begins the significant information of the sermon. God here is said to have raised up David. Okay? When God raised up David, that means that he put him on the scene or that he was born. Okay? We already saw this back in chapter 3 where Deuteronomy 18.18 was used when God raised up the prophet. And that was used to determine Jesus. Okay? It means uh, So raising up could mean placing David on the scene. We need to get these things out of here. Okay? It's, it's the exact same Greek phrase. Okay? Okay, so raise, raise up, obviously not that you need to use the word raise, uh, up that. it could mean um, to be put on the scene, another way of saying that they're just, they're just born, okay? But raising up could also just mean resurrection, resurrection from the dead, as we say in Georgia, the day it. All right, so it could mean either term. Okay, so let's keep track of these right here. In uh, 22, raising up David there, does that fit number one or does that fit number two? Number one, okay. Any, any disagreement there? Um, when I looked at this first, uh, I didn't have my UBS, but I did look it up on uh, goodlows.com, okay. which is just an uh, interactive Bible, Bible app. The word raise up in that verse and verse 33 is different. I know. We have a, a euro, we have an astasis, but they're considered to be, uh, I mean, meaning the same thing. They mean the same thing, but yes. it's a different word. Yes. Okay. You, you said that they're the same word, and that's how I was confused. I well, it, it's, it's getting used in the same way. Okay. Okay. That's what I was just, I was just making and we'll, sure. We'll make this, yeah, it's just, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of words that are synonyms. And in John chapter 20, oh, I want to say 2021, 20, he says, As the Father has sent me, I now send you. He uses tempo and apostello. Okay. But obviously they mean the same thing. As the Father has sent me, I send you. It's just it's using different words, but they mean the same thing. Okay, I, I was just, I didn't know if there was significance. Yeah, I'm, I'm, aware, I'm aware of that. And of course, I'm, I'm very interested in those distinctions. But when I look at it, I don't think the text is making anything of that. But it's, it's a good point. Okay, so... And so I, I want to kind of keep track of, of how these are used. Okay, so what, what verse is this? We see the first one, 13, 22. I'm going to put 20. How did that just die in like five seconds? All right, 22 is the first time we see that. All right. Okay, by the way, um, this language is used for raising up someone, putting them on the scene, getting them born. Uh, it's often used in the Hebrew Bible. I gave you like 10 examples right there. Obviously, Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18 is a major one. 2 Samuel 7, 12. God, through the prophet Nathan, tells David about his son. When your days, when you, David, when your days are complete, when you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you. Okay? Meaning Solomon. I'm gonna, he's going to be born. Uh, I'm going to raise up your descendant after him. Okay? That, that in 2 Samuel 7, 12, that did not mean resurrection. It meant... Um, I'm going to put him on the scene. Okay? Uh, so we've got all these passages where it talks about this. So this so, um, and by the way, Luke has already acknowledged this definition in Acts 3.22 and 3.26. Okay? So Luke has already demonstrated that he believes that you can use raising up in this particular way. That's my argument so far. All right. Um, and then the quote there, 
would say that uh, a man after my own heart found, um, I found David, the son of Jesse, that's a double quote from uh, Psalm 89 and 1 Samuel 13, 14. Um, some people actually argue, by the way, that uh, the one who, is, who will do my will is actually a quote from uh, Isaiah. Um, actually, it's a quote of Isaiah where God says it of Cyrus. That makes a little bit more of an interesting discussion, but we're going to move on because I don't think he makes anything out of it. Okay. Um, Paul then argues, verse uh, 23, probably one of the most significant Christological passages here, is that from the descendants of this man, whose man? David. From the descendants of David, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. Okay? Uh, Paul then argues from the descendants, that's literally the word seed, with the spermatos, of David, the man David, according to the promise, has come Jesus. Okay? This indicates, since Jesus is a lineal descendant of David, he has to come from David's seed. Um, and Luke has already told us this in his genealogy in Luke chapter 3. Those are the verses if you want to look it up. Um, so, from the descendants of this man, according to the promise, I'm, I'm watching this word promise, okay? This promise of the human descendant born of David's line is an important aspect of this sermon's theology. Okay, I want to know what the promise is. So the very first time we see promise, what is the promise? That someone would be a descendant of David's, David's seed, right? Verse 23. So the very first time we have the word promise, I want you to focus on this. This is part of my argument. Okay. So from there, we've got, notice how we went from the patriarchs to Egypt to the conquest of the land, the judges, to Samuel, to Saul, to David. And David's like, oh, he's going to raise up Jesus. Then we get to John the Baptist and Jesus. Okay. Like, he, just, he moves on pretty quickly. We've got the life of John the Baptist and Jesus. It's the only time, by the way, that Paul is going to talk about John the Baptist. Ever in the Bible. Um, uh, Jesus is killed, but God woke him up from the dead. This is the second occurrence of the word raised uh, in verse uh, 30. It's actually the same, same Greek that's used here back in verse 22. All right, verse 30, but God raised from the dead. God woke him up. Okay, so there in verse 30, that refers to this right here, resurrection from the dead. Because it qualifies the raising, raised from the dead. Okay? Anybody have any arguments about me putting verse 30 with, with number 2? No, it's pretty clear. All right. All right. Um, all right, so yeah, but he, uh, here it clearly means resurrection from the dead. Uh, it's the same word meant uh, that we saw meant to be born or placed on the scene in verse 22. We're going to establish that. All right. Um, the believers, verse, uh, verse 32, we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. The believers are the ones who preach, he says, we. We preach the gospel of the promise made to the fathers, okay? I don't know what that promise is. What's that promise? Earlier the promise was defined as the birthing of Jesus from David's line. Okay? So, what is the promise? The promise is that Jesus be born of David's line. So it's about birth. This promise, verse 33, God has fulfilled, and then he raised up Jesus according to Psalm 27. You are my son, today I become your father, or today I be God. Alright? So, the argument of this passage pertains to, so this is where the thing is, because um, if you read the commentary, you're going to get one particular answer. If you listen to certain classes here, you might get another particular answer. But you can actually see that, you can see why people don't even agree on how it's being used here. Okay? I'll get to you in a second. Let me, let me kind of unpack this here, and I think I'll probably answer your question. Um, so the argument is that he's saying, hey, um, how does he word it there? Uh, verse 33, God has fulfilled the promise to the children in that he raised up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm. So he raised up Jesus as Psalm 2 says. So did he raise Jesus up according to one or raise Jesus up according to two? He's asking which one is, is Psalm 2 trying to say. So, all right. Um, so either being raised up from the birth of the line of David or being resurrected from the dead. Both are two options. Both ways of defining the verb have already been used by Luke in this passage so far. So more information needs to be assessed so as to solve this. Okay, now, you need to be able to blank out everything you know from the New Testament. Just think about Psalm 2 by itself, okay? All right, I'll think about what Psalm 2 is doing, looking forward. Think about Psalm 2 by itself. Originally, Psalm 2 was an enthronement psalm praising an unnamed anointed king belong to Israel. In fact, it's probably best that we just go to Psalm 2 uh, so we can see this, okay? It's so difficult for us to not read back into the Old Testament, our New Testament understanding of this psalm. 
But as we've already seen, the New Testament could reinterpret or find further meaning from the original Old Testament passages. All right, so in Psalm 2, we see this. Verse 1, Why are the nations in an uproar, the people devising vain things? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against Against who? Yahweh. It's Yahweh and against his anointed. That's the word Mashiach. You've got two different people there. You've got Yahweh and yep. his anointed king. We don't know who this anointed king is. It's an unnamed king. We don't know if it's David or Solomon. We don't know who it is. Okay? Now, look at what happens in verse 6. As for me, God, I have installed my king. Notice in verse 2, he was called my anointed. In verse 6, he's called my king. He has installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. That's Jerusalem. Okay? When he installs his king, he can says, he can say, so now the psalmist is speaking in verse 7, I will tell, uh, to tell the decree of the Lord, he has said, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Notice, son of God there, in verse 7, refers to being the king, refers to being the anointed king. This is really important. Son of God became a messianic title of the anointed Christ because of passages like this. And the promise, of course, in verse 8, Ask me, and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as possession. You will break them with a rod of iron, shatter them like earth and wear, da da da. Okay, so in verse 2, he's called the anointed, the Mashiach, the Septuagint has the Christ. Verse 6, he's called the king on the mountain. But in verse 7, he is called God's son, and that he has begotten him. Okay? Originally in Psalm 2, I think from verse 6 and verse 7, to be called God's son to be called, and for God to quote unquote father him is to be established as the king. He's not birthing him in verse 7. He's already alive in verse 6 and verse 2. You see that? So originally in Psalm 2, it was about how the Son of God was a title for the anointed king. It didn't indicate the king's birth. You see at least that. I mean, whether you agree with it or not, you see how I'm interpreting that specifically from Psalm 2. Okay? Son of God there meant, like, God is, is God. He is the Son, but that is a title for the anointed king that God has installed Right there, okay? So it's an enthronement psalm. Okay. However, it would not be odd for you, for Luke, to use the Old Testament citation slightly differently, right? Have we seen that, all right? So, treading carefully here. Luke has already indicated that David was raised up, put on the scene, and that Jesus' birth from David's line was according to the promise. We're going to talk about this, following this promise word, all right? This same promise, back in Acts, back in Acts, the same promise, so the promise is in verse 23. The same promise shows up in verse 32. We preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. Okay? Um, the same promise is leaked in verse 32 defined as being fulfilled when God raised up Jesus. So if the promise in verse 23 is about the birth of Jesus, then the promise in verse 32 being defined as being raised up, I argue, must also be about the birth of Jesus. Okay? That's, my argument is connecting how promise is understood in that passage. In other words, if the promise in, in 1323 referred to the birth of Jesus, then the fulfillment of the promise in 3233 must also refer to his birth, rather than his resurrection. I will say back in Psalm 2, could, could anyone originally have read Psalm 2 back in ancient Israel and thought that it referred to resurrection? No. That would not even be on their radar of choices. Okay. If this is the case, then Luke is using Psalm 2-7 to refer to the birth of Jesus rather than his installment as the anointed king, okay? Because the options here are not to be born on the scene, resurrection, and anoint, you know, set up as, as his king. He's not making the, the argument of the installment of the king. The options are to be born or to be raised from the dead. Uh, by the way, Luke has already indicated in Luke 135 that Jesus is God's son precisely because of his miracle birth. Meaning that Jesus was already the son of God from his birth. He doesn't have to be identified as son of God some later time, according to Luke. Okay? Now, it's clear in verse 34. Okay, so my argument is that tentatively, verse 33 refers to this. Tentatively. Okay? But in verse 34, that he raised him from the dead. Um, and then he won't uh, be allowed, uh, he won't uh, suffer decay. Um, how is raising up being used there? Number one or two? Two. Two, okay? So what most scholars do, the argument of most scholars, and of, of even your commentary, 
is that verse 34 refers to resurrection of the dead along the same lines of verse 33. So they would argue verse 33 also refers to this. Okay? What that would do is that, that would take away from Luke speaking of the, the beginning of Jesus and the birthing of Jesus. Despite the fact that in verse 22, or sorry, verse 23, that Jesus is of the descendants of David, that's already there. That's not, that's not arguable. You see how complicated this is? Okay, now, now let's have some discussion there. Okay, I can bet your hand at first. Um, so that's the conclusion when I came up to, uh -huh. was that it first refers to him being born. Yeah. Like, but I think it, I think it's birth in a different sense because whoever's reading the composition of Acts is hopefully already read the first volume of Luke. Yeah. And so they would understand that Jesus was obviously had this kind of miraculous conception of birth. So what I think that what the kind of conclusion I came to after reading Fitzmaier and wrestling with a little bit is that when it says that, that Jesus was raised up and was raised up in the Davidic line, but he was also raised up like it was like almost a, a new type of beginning because it's not uncommon for Paul to talk about like the first fruits of the, of the dead and stuff like that. Yeah. So it seems like this is kind of the new beginning that has happened because he was he was begotten oh, I see. eternal life. Oh, I see. So you you would interpret his resurrection as a beginning. I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's like so it's like the the, the way I put it in my papers the the earth was like a pregnant woman who was like having birth pains and when Jesus came out it was a new beginning of eternal life. Yeah. And so in verse thirty it, Jesus raised from the dead. Verse thirty three he was raised in the Davidic line. He was this new beginning sense and then it compares him to David going under decay but Jesus didn't go under decay. Yeah. So that, that shows that yeah. he's also the second born. Yeah. Do you do you see here how actually the answer is not entirely clear. You see yeah. how it could go both ways, yeah. okay? And, and, and I, I will admit to you, my argument, I don't think my argument is, is so completely um, uh, pers per persuadable. Like, I don't think that mine is like, like that it's the clearest argument. I think it's it's most likely, I think it's kind of like the evidence from like 60, 40. But I can understand how people think that, that, uh, that he's interpreting Psalm 2 in resurrection terms. But, I don't think it's that difficult. I thought the answer was pretty easy. It's talking about number one, not number two. I don't know why people. Like, I didn't have that much trouble with that. Yeah, I, I really because, don't think it's as complicated. Yeah, just because it's surrounded by our. Yeah, because. I mean, because, look at the context that it's in. Yeah. yeah. Really, it's not talking about resurrection. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, verse 34 talks about resurrection. Verse yeah, 30 talks that. about resurrection. Okay? So, it would, in a sense, I could, if I were to play devil's advocate, I could say. How come in verse 30 he means resurrection and verse 34 means resurrection, but in the middle of those verses he's going to change to something else? Okay, well, okay, so like, what was the, what was the good, okay, so like, what, what I said in my paper was, um, in verse 32, we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. What was the promise made to the fathers? Yeah. The promise made to the fathers was somebody who's going to come from the line who's going to, uh, through the world, was going to bless the world, and was going to be a king. Nothing about a dead Messiah being raised from the dead. That okay. was a promise no. to them. Oh, I see. I shall All right. In, uh, in 2 Samuel 7, 14, English says, When your days are complete, you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your sin and after you. Okay? Um, okay. And uh, the Greek says, I will, on a... On a Anastiso, I will raise up your seed after you. Okay? okay? That's the verb which means resurrection. Okay? But it also means to be raised up. Okay? okay. So they would look at this in the Septuagint and say, look, that's the word for resurrection, but it's also the word for this right there. So you would see how they would withdraw that. They someone could argue that, hey, these are promises made to the fathers. That's true, that's true, it's true. But yeah. the second half of verse 33, as it is written. So whatever is said in the first half of verse 33 is just like what is said. Yeah, in Psalm but, two. but it was as it is written in Psalm 2. But my argument is that originally in Psalm 2, it didn't refer to the birth, and it didn't refer to resurrection. It referred to the his, his installment as the king. He's reinterpreting oh, okay. Psalm 2, not, not messianically, because Psalm 2 was, was understood messianically in Qumran and, and with the rabbis, but they understood it Christologically from the sense of Jesus. It, it's tricky, it's tricky. What do you think? So I have two things. First is an interesting point. Do you think that the reason why Luke has in his narrative the birth of Jesus in the gospel is because of this idea, ideology maybe, was in his head, 
about him being like because Luke's the only one that really has the detailed version of that's beside the point. Like okay. he has like the, the birth of Jesus and this is kind of talking about raising him up like the birth of yeah. Jesus. But that, that's that's beside the point. That was just kind of a yeah. question. Well, well remember, he's already used this racing of language in Peter's sermon chapter three. But there, he didn't use racing up language from Psalm 2. There he used racing up language from Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise up a prophet from among your own countrymen. Okay? okay. Deuteronomy 18 did not mean resurrection. It yeah. meant I'm going to put someone on the scene. Okay? From among your own countrymen, by the way. Notice he had to be an Israelite. Okay, yeah. And, so, I, and I have one more thing. Sorry. Sure. Go ahead. Um, and the argument I made was that, you know, we obviously know that in verse 35 and 36, uh, Jesus is the Holy One referenced here. And uh, he said the Holy One didn't undergo decay. Yeah. But it says David did undergo decay. But why is the same phrase used for both of them if one of them didn't, wasn't resurrected and then one of them was? Yeah. Therefore, the, the uh, variable there is the other option, obviously being born or being put on the scene, which would be the same as in verse 22 and in verse 33. Yeah. Comparing Jesus and my, my, my devil's advocate counter argument to you is that the way that Jesus did not undergo decay was because he was the recipient of resurrection and David wasn't. But David David was raised. No, right? no. David underwent decay because he's dead. No. no Jesus no, no, no. didn't undergo decay because he was raised from the dead. Yeah, but the same word is used for that. I understand. But when this is used in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, it was to say that it, it, from Psalm 16, that's, that's where the quotation is coming from. He's trying to say that God raised this person from the dead because he's trying to say that Psalm 101 doesn't refer to David, my Lord David, but it's a Psalm of David. It refers to Jesus because Jesus has been raised from the dead. That's my, I, I, I'm playing devil's advocate with you. My point is that if in your paper, if you argue for number two, I'm not going to say you're wrong because I'm saying like it's, it's not super clear, but I'm making, I'm giving you my argument as to why I think, and I think the, the, the crutch of the argument is two points. One, the promise. The promise deals with the birth of Jesus from the line of David, and the promise is fulfilled in verse 32. Secondly, we know from that Luke already in Acts chapter 3 has, uh, has used this phrase in conjunction with raising of Jesus in the same way that Deuteronomy 18.18 18 was raising Jesus, and that was to be referred to his birth. So that, that's my argument there. But I'm telling you, like, like, my argument is the minority argument. Not everyone agrees with my argument there, but I'm, I'm arguing against the, the commentary, and that's okay. But you're going to have people, you're going to say, hey, how do you know that Jesus was born? So you say, oh, look, Acts 13, 33, it quotes Psalm 2. Well, you're going to go back to Psalm 2 and try to argue that. There's some people that can give a good argument to you against that, and you've got to be able to wrestle with this. Uh, I agree with the, the part about it being put on the scene as uh, messianic role and I think I put it too much emphasis on his birth, though. I think that since he's arguing with the Jews out of the synagogue, he's arguing for the Messianic role that he's trying to convince them that the Messiah has come, not necessarily about his birth, but that he has put the promise to make. Yeah, but, but in order for someone to be the Messiah, they have to be of the line of David. Right, yeah. So, so like, like, arguing, I, like Paul could never claim to be the Messiah because he's not from the line of Judah. Right. Paul's from the line of Benjamin. Okay? So in order to say this Jesus is the one that was there, he has to make the argument that he is from that line of David. Right, I'm not sure where you're arguing like uh, birth so much on uh, Well, I'm not arguing. Like, like, right. So okay, here, here's my thing. Um, however you interpret verse 33, verse 23 is an unarguable um, point that says Jesus is of the seed of David. The word is sent there. It's actually the word seed. The word sperma does. Okay? Um, so that, that implies that Luke, although we already knew it from Luke's gospel, that he thinks that Jesus is a lineal human descendant from David's line. Okay, do we agree on that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, that, by the way, that gets rid of any sort of pre-existence, by the way. That's a pretty clear point there. Um, but you see, he has to say that. He, he has to say um, that uh, it's, it's from there. Now, if verse 22, he raised up David to be their king, notice, raised up to be king, raised up to be king. Son of God is, is the Messianic title of being the king. Jesus right. has to be raised up to be the king, to be that king. So if raising up means birth, then Jesus was raised up to be that king, and this fulfills part of his argument. Right, I'm saying the main emphasis is on the 
fulfilling the promise of the messianic king, not necessarily as a yeah. Point. Well, yeah. There, there's a, um, you know, they have to. You have to agree that they have to read the, the Old Testament a little creatively to get the resurrection of the Messiah, because oh, yeah. there are no Jews that were expecting the Messiah to die. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so the resurrection of the Messiah was also something no one was expecting. So the transformation of all the why yeah. it can't be a resurrection. Well, he is interpreting it messianically. I, I, know, I just, it, it's good that we had this discussion here. Um, Can I ask one more question? Before? Sure, go ahead. And then we okay. got the line. It being sandwiched between the resurrection verse and like, like him being of David, could it have dual meaning? Because that's what I, it, well, it well, makes sense to me to, for that one phrase to mean beginning from the earth, which is also, also means being resurrected. Yeah, my, my, my question is, that I wanted to know is, how is, is Luke interpreting Psalm 2? Is Luke interpreting Psalm 2? Because here's the thing, Psalm 2 originally did not mean any of these two options. I know that we've been taught that it means this. If you go back and read Psalm 2, it doesn't mean this. Okay? Psalm 2 means this person was, was placed on the throne of David and he is now declared to be God's son. Okay? Either Luke is reinterpreting it as number one or he's reinterpreting it as number two. Okay? Either way, Luke is reinterpreting Psalm 2. Messianically, Christologically, from the perspective of Jesus. Is he reinterpreting it as number one or number two? One. That, that, well, that's, I'm, I'm saying, like, that's, that's the question I want you guys to wrestle with. Yeah, okay. I think it's one. What do you think? Just real quick, I'm on the lines of what David said. I do think that's a good one. Because at first I did consider it for the resurrection, but then when it's a song soon, I looked at more or less about the kingship. Like, you know, come to the scene and all of that, and being raised up and raised up and raised up and raised up and father, and have that authority and that. So I look at being raised up as more of a status or an authoritative nature yeah. uh, than being alongside with them. Because that's according to the big problem, it's going to be uh, in the lines of David and the addition of being raised up as a kingship and all the Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's my point, is that originally in Psalm 2, it was uh, Son of God there meant the, the kingship, the role of king. Right. And you can see how Son of God from Psalm 2 said had grew with that messianic connotation. Son of God meant the anointed king of the kingdom who was going to rule all of the nations. You can see how it developed with that. And obviously 2 Samuel 7, 14, I will be your father, he will be my son, in the context of the Davidic king. God being his father, he's going to be the son. So, uh, the interesting thing, by the way, is that in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5, he actually combines Psalm 2, 7 and 2 Samuel 7, 14 together and uses them of Jesus. Because of the two Old Testament passages talk about being the Son of God. But he argues it against Jesus being an angel. So, okay. Um, hmm, how much is it? Why two more slides and seven more minutes? All right. All right. Uh, so let's shift away from this. Okay, so 1334. Um, that's, I think that's a good discussion, but I want us to, to I mean, I want us to wrestle with that as I'm wrestling with my paper here. Okay. All right, 1334 cites Isaiah 55, verse 3, which says this, I will give you, you, by the way, is you in the plural. You can't see that in your translation. I will give you, the people of Israel, the holy and sure blessings of David. This is a, an after the exile. Uh, Isaiah 55 is writing people presupposing uh, that they're coming out of exile uh, after the 586 exile. Um, and it promises the people the holy and sure blessings of David. Um, and by the way, so if the people are going to get the sure promises of David, Look how it's interpreted in verse 38. Those people are going to get the blessings of David. Therefore, it be known to you, brethren, that through him, through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. So through Jesus, through the sin of David, it goes to the people. They get the forgiveness of sins. And in verse 39, through him, through the sin of David, the people are free. Literally, the uh, Greek words, they are justified. They are justified. Justification by faith. And he says in verse 39, you're either justified from all things for believing. You know, by faith, you're justified from all things which you could not have been justified through the law of Moses. So either you're justified by faith or you're justified by observing Torah. By the way, Paul talks about justification by faith and not by works of Torah in Galatians 2.16 and Romans 3.28. That's for an entirely other class, which we had last semester. Are you saying that's the last of this passage that he's referring to? No, he's, he's, he's making a different argument. His argument at this point is to say the blessings promised to David are now going to be given to the people. Because Isaiah 53, or sorry, 55 verse 3 are, says that it's written to people. With the you there 
in verse 34, give you the holy people, both the Hebrew and the Greek is in the plural, it's you in the plural, second person plural. So he's given the people the blessings of David as opposed to the promises of David being solely focused on the king. Of course, this is no problem for us because we know the king represents his people. And so how do the blessings of David get passed on? They get forgiveness of sins and they get justification. That's how he makes that argument there. Okay, now, verse 40. Can somebody read verses 40 and 41, please? Therefore, therefore take heed to the things spoken of and the prophets uh, may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers of marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing the work of your days. A work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. Okay, so this is from Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. Habakkuk was a pre exilic prophet, so he was writing before 586. Okay, uh, he's a contemporary of Jeremiah, so his enemies are the Babylonians. All right, so in the Masoretic text, the original context, if you go back in Habakkuk, it'll say this Look among the nations, the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I'm doing something.